Well, good afternoon. Um, thanks, Senator Murphy. My job, I think, for the rest of the panel here is to be kind of a setup man, to kind of make, keep my remarks broad enough so that it provides a kind of umbrella for the speakers that come after me. So there won't be too many surprises here, but I hope to start off with a broad discussion of some of the impacts on New England. Now, I'm a long-term New England <coughs> resident, proud to be so. I don't think we live in one of the most dangerous areas of the world by any means. We don't have the fires that the California has. We don't have the floods that Colorado has this week. But we have our own hazards. Just to remind you a bit about our little corner of the world, we live in a fairly mountainous area. The mountains uh, increase the precipitation over the region and channel that precipitation into rivers that increase the possibility of flooding. We have a distribution of um, deciduous trees. You see on the left, the red indicates where the uh, deciduous trees live in um, New England, and they play a great role in our climate in terms of evaporating, enhancing the evaporation of soil water and moistening the atmosphere, especially in the so-called leaf-out season, basically from mid-March until mid-October. We also have uh, agriculture. It's shrinking. The red areas on the right side there indicate where you still have traditional agriculture going on in New England. The, by, by the way, these are both as detected from, uh, from Earth orbiting satellites. So this is the broad view. This is the kind of um, universe in which we live here in New England. And um, in addition, we have the storms. I think Kerry's going to talk much more about the storms. But basically, if you ask a meteorologist what's special about New England weather, they'll almost always bring up these two points. First of all, in the upper left, we are at a location of converging storm tracks. We get winter storms that start up in Alberta, the so-called Alberta Clippers. We get uh, winter storms that start in Colorado and come east towards our location. And most infamous are the nor'easters that start down in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico or up along the uh, Carolina coastline and come up from the south and cause us a variety of storms uh, here in New England. And then, of course, in the summertime, uh, we get the uh, uh, tropical cyclones that come up out of the tropical North Atlantic and impact us. So we are kind of in a crossfire here in New England between these different kinds of storms. So you can put together a list. This isn't a scientist list. This is just a, a New England residence list. I mean, I've experienced a lot of these things myself, and so have you. Uh, we get the winter blizzards and nor'easters, and there are some of the dates recent and not so recent, when there have been notable storms of this kind. We get hurricanes that hit New England. Uh, uh, the Great New England Hurricane of 1938 was perhaps the most famous, but now, of course, we look to Irene and Sandy from last year. We get ice storms, where you get uh, supercooled water falling on the landscape, destroying trees and power lines. We get heat waves, including one from this summer. I'm sure you remember that severe convection and tornadoes, and of course, air pollution events. What we want to do is to find out which of these are, um, might get worse, which ones might get better as we pass into the next 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 years. And that's part of what the panel will be talking about today. There's been quite a bit of literature on this, a growing literature. Here are some covers from a few um, reports, all fairly recent. The earliest one of course, is the IPCC report there, which is 2007. And just about 10 days from now, we expect the next version of that report. We're all excited to see it come out, except to be honest with you, we know most of what's in it, because the way the protocol on the IPCC reports works is that it reports mostly on work that's already been published in peer-reviewed journals. So in fact, those of us that read those journals have a pretty good idea of what the new IPCC report is going to change, is going to say. Only some of the um, final conclusions are unknown to us. But a lot of good work has been going on, and as Mark um, indicated, Yale's going to get involved in this kind of work as well, and I think we can make a real contribution to it. I'm going to pull a few diagrams out of some of these reports uh, to show you what we expect over the next few years. This comes from, uh, this will probably be in the new IPCC report. And it is the uh, expected surface temperature change globally 
from pre-industrial to the end of the current century, according to the high emission scenario. So with all those words there, let me just point out what you need to know about this. The scale is rather impressive all by itself. It's in degrees Celsius, and the deep reds go up into the four, five, seven, even 11 degrees Celsius, and those in the back might be able to see. Maybe it's possible to darken the light on the screen, but New England, rather in the wintertime, December, January, February, has a rather remarkable localized warming that gets up into the uh, 5 to 7, even almost 10 degrees Celsius under this extreme emission scenario called RCP 85, which I can talk more about if there are questions. But that's certainly one of the things we're keeping an eye on, and I'm going to be emphasizing that. They've also done these simulations using climate models for the summer months, and we see extraordinary warmings as well, especially again in the high latitudes and in New England, not quite as large as, as in the wintertime, but still extraordinarily temp extraordinary temperature increases uh, in this part of the world. Um, the modelers also produce forecasts of precipitation. Here in the wintertime, December, January, February, we find uh, notable increases in precipitation in New England with somewhat high confidence. In other words, the different models that have run, been run on, on this issue seem to agree that in the wintertime we're going to be getting more precipitation uh, in the wintertime. In the summertime, however, it's not so clear. If you can work this out, it takes a while to do so. These diagrams are complicated. But basically, New England shows up either in the no change or in the disagreement area, which means the models don't agree very well. But what they all agree on is that the increased temperatures will cause increased evaporation rates. That'll be the big, big impact for New England water-wise, will be the increased evaporation rates in the summertime. So just a word or two about what this temperature rise will do for New England. More heat waves and a, a greatly increased power demand for air conditioning. We saw that um, this summer. Warmer winters with less snow, the skiing industry will be going out of business. Longer leaf out season, the leaves will come out earlier and especially stay longer in the fall. That means more evaporation, less of a snow melt pulse down the rivers, and in the wintertime, in the summertime already, New England rivers tend to dry out. That'll be greatly enhanced in the future. Most of the rivers you're familiar with will get quite dry in the summertime. Warming lake and coastal waters, that has an impact on power generation and sea life. Changing ecosystems, insects, invasive plants, shifting forests and vector-borne diseases. Degrading air quality because temperature plays a role in the conversion of primary pollutants to damaging ozone concentrations. And finally, the agriculture is going to be hit both for better and for worse, longer growing seasons, but many crops will be impaired by heat, drought, and insects. Here's the one I don't like to see. This is the frequency of heat waves, days over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Today it's only a few, excuse me, today it's only a few days a year. At the end of the century it could be a good fraction of the summer, especially in the high emission scenario, scenario. but even in the low emission scenario, many more days of uh, very high temperatures here in Connecticut. This one's for Hartford. I like this diagram. I got it from one of those New England reports. It shows us in New England skipping southwards, essentially, as the climate warms. This, isn't, this is a little bit sloppy. It doesn't have the whole picture, but in general, in terms of mean summer temperatures, this shows that by the end of the century, in the high emission scenario, will be basically uh, Georgia and South Carolinians here, here in, um, perhaps not politically, I hope, but at least, <laughs> at least um, climate-wise. And what about the forests, our beloved forests here in Connecticut? Um, really a dramatic change. And this shows, I won't go through this in detail, but it shows the current state of the forests, especially um, the maple um, and uh, beech forests are going to largely disappear. The pine forests will be gone. I'm sorry, the spruce forests will be gone, and we'll have a very different makeup of forests. Um, to wrap up, just a word or two about, about sea level rise. This is the um, 
older forecast for sea level rise by the year 2100, only about that much or so, but now the new forecasts are getting to be the order of almost twice that. That's probably the biggest change between the last IPCC report and the new one is the degree of sea level rise. What will that do for New England? Well, of course, it'll flood areas. These are the, these are the high water marks, uh, mostly from Hurricane Sandy for, for New Haven, Connecticut. But one other thing that we don't think so much about, but as sea level rises, that influence comes inland as well. And it comes inland in two ways. If here is sea level, that controls the intrusion of salt water into the land. And it also controls, at least if you're within five or 10 miles of the shoreline, it controls the water table as well. So as sea level rises, this curve rises, and so does the water table. And uh, that means, for example, here in New Haven, these are some recent calculations by the USGS, that if the water in the sound rises, so will groundwater uh, in the city of New Haven and the surrounding coastal areas. And that has a great impact on all underground structures, including foundations of buildings, um, subways. Everything you put below ground is going to be influenced by this rising sea level, even if you're not at the coast and even if you're not experiencing a storm and a storm surge. I've gone over my time, so I'll leave it there and thank you.